So Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he had lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, the horror of growing up as a child in the 1970s and 80s. Imagine this. I wanted to watch television. And my parents had this huge console TV. And the horror, just thinking about this, that if I wanted to turn the TV on, I actually had to get my butt up off the couch, walk up to the TV, and there was a knob on it. And you had to pull the knob out, and that turned the TV on. And then if the volume was too high or too low, and you needed to change the volume, guess what? You had to get up again, walk up to it, and that knob that you pulled out, you could turn it right to turn the volume up, you could turn it left, and that turned the volume down. And then again, if you wanted to change the channel, there was a dial. You could dial in all maybe half a dozen stations or so. And again, you had to get up off the couch to go do that. First world problem. Greatest invention in the world. <laughs> a TV remote. The thing is, though, you know, we've almost come full circle. About two years ago, our, our television went out. It wasn't working anymore. So we went to Best Buy. We bought a, a, a new television. But this new television, so much unlike that television I grew up with, there were no buttons. There were no dials. Nothing to turn it on but the remote. Now, you know my kids, right? You know where this is going. What happened? One day the remote goes missing. We're, we're looking for the remote everywhere. We look in the drawers. They're not there. Take the cushions off the, the furniture. Look underneath the cushions. No. Find a whole bunch of other stuff there. But no remote control. We move the furniture. Look underneath the furniture. Yet you can't find it underneath the furniture. Where is the remote? So what do we do? We, we go back and look in all the same places where we had just looked. Maybe we overlooked. Maybe we missed it somewhere along the way. We could not find it. And it was frustrating. We were not going to be able to turn on that TV unless we found the remote. Well, nothing was going to stop us from finding it. So what did I do? I, I took the couch. I literally took the couch and I flipped it upside down. And when I flipped the couch, I heard jostling inside of the couch. So I take the, the fabric that was on the bottom of the couch and I tear it back. And I look inside. Guess what I found? Candy. 
toys, money, <laughs> loose change, and the remote control. There was rejoicing that day in the wrestler house that once was, was once lost was now found. And now the TV that we could not turn on, we could now watch. Why do I tell that story? I bet you can, can relate. You've had a similar experience in your life where you lost something and you looked and you searched and you just could not find it. Maybe it was, maybe it was your car keys. Yeah? I've, I have some stories about those too. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was a check. Something that went missing. And how did you feel when you found it? A sense of relief? A sense of rejoicing? A sense of satisfaction. We heard that story, two stories today in our scripture reading. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin. The shepherd goes searching for the one lost sheep of the 99 and he finds it and there's rejoicing. The widow, she loses the one coin. She turns her house upside down. She finds it. And once again, there is rejoicing. I want to invite you, we're going to look a little closer at these two parables today. I want to invite you to open up the Pew Bible in front of you. Luke chapter 15, it's on page 1,112. So page 1,112 in the Pew Bible. And again, it is Luke chapter 15, starting at the first verse. This whole chapter, in fact, there's three stories. If you look at this, this chapter, there's three stories in this chapter. The two we had read, and then the famous prodigal son parable of Jesus, the parable of the lost son. And these three stories, this chapter in the scripture, really gets to the heart of God. It gets to the character of God, who God is and what he is. He does. He seeks out that which is lost, and he will not stop until it is found. The beginning of this section, it has two groups of people. 15 verse 1. There were tax collectors, and there were sinners. And what were they doing? They were drawing near to Jesus to hear what he had to say. Opposed to the tax collectors and sinners, another group of people are there. And that's the Pharisees and the scribes. They're not drawing near to Jesus to hear what he has to say. What are they doing? They are grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. I talked about this last week in my message. Religion of law. Performance-based religion. When you have a bunch of rules, and the idea is that in order to draw near to God, you've got to follow and obey all of those rules. Performance-based religion develops two types of people. First of all, it develops religious people. Those who seek to follow all of those rules, but in following those rules, they become prideful, and they look down upon other people. Now, you think about this. Uh, I volunteer on this committee. I teach Bible study. I go to church each and every Sunday. I give a tenth of my income through the tithes and offerings. And then, you know, those other people, you know, those that are not as faithful as me, look at them. So, Works-based religion, it produces prideful religious people. It also produces what we'll call rebellious people. Those who look at the, the rules and the laws and everything that they're expected to obey, and they'll say, I can't do that. And so rather than even trying, they don't try at all, and they just live how they're going to live, and do what they want to do. And so you have these two groups of people here at work in this story. There's, first of all, the tax collectors and the sinners, the rebellious people who've kind of given up this whole idea of living faithfully and trying to obey all those rules. And then you have the Pharisees and the scribes who, you know, they, they've 
dotted all the I's, they've crossed all the T's, and they looked down at these other people over those Pharisees and tax collectors, they're not like us. How can God possibly love people like that? So Jesus, he tells this parable. And verse 4, he says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one is lost until he finds it? The next story I want to point out, verse 8. So you have a hundred sheep, verse 8, or a or, hundred sheep in verse 4. How many coins do you have in verse 8? Ten coins. And then we go on to the next story that Jesus tells. Again, we didn't read this one. But verse 11, a man has how many sons? Two sons. So we go from a hundred sheep to ten coins to two sons. And I believe that there is significance in the fact that Jesus tells these three stories in that way. The hundred, the ten, the two. Every person, every person matters to God. You know, you think of the starving child in a third world country. Anonymous to you. You don't know their name. You've seen their face in the ad for a charity. That nameless child has a name and matters to God. Maybe you have a child of your own. You know the name of that child. You are intimately aware of that child. That child matters as much to God as the nameless, anonymous child living somewhere else. Every life matters to God. And as his people, we are called to serve all and not to distinguish in terms of who we serve. Uh, we do our Haiti meal packing in the spring. Over the course of the last three years, we've provided close to 300,000 meals for children in Haiti. And imagine this. Every once in a while, I've had someone come up to me and they'll say something uh, along the lines of, shouldn't we be helping kids in our own country who are starving? And I agree. Certainly, yes, we should be doing that. But the, the whole point, their whole point is that we shouldn't be doing this over here. But what God says, what Jesus says in our reading today American kids matter to God. Haitian children matter to God. All children, all adults, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of political affiliation, every life matters to him. And we're called to serve all as his people without distinguishment. Another thing we pull out of this text is that God does not give up on those who are lost. Go back to verse 4. He goes out, he leaves the 99, and he goes after the one that is lost until, until when? Until it's too hard to search anymore? No, he does not give up until the lost one is found. That remote control, if, if I would have had to go out into our garage and start going through the garbage, I was, I was about ready to do that. That would not have stopped me. I would not have stopped until we found that remote control. And it's the same way. God does not stop until what is lost is found. And the great comfort here is that I cannot wander so far that God's grace cannot reach me. I cannot do something so bad 
that God cannot forgive me. God will do what it takes, no matter the cost. And think about the cost. What did he do to find you and me lost sinners? The price he paid. He gave his one and only son to die on the cross for you and for me. No one is so far gone that they're beyond the reach of God's grace. And the thing is, is that the more we're lost, it helps us actually when it comes to being found, it it helps us to appreciate our having been found all the more. Think about a recovering alcoholic. They appreciate their sobriety so much more than someone who's been sober their whole life. Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. Now the Pharisees, you think about them. Clearly, the tax collectors and sinners, those were lost people, right? Were the Pharisees and the scribes any more found than the tax collectors and sinners? The truth of the matter is they were just as lost. And maybe they were even more lost because they didn't even realize they were lost. And sometimes that happens as believers. We have the grace of God, but we fail to recognize our own lostness. And that puts us in a dangerous place. The Pharisees, they had what was called a blind spot. And each and every one of us, we have blind spots in our lives. Places, areas where we're walking lost and don't even recognize it. I heard this illustration the other day. The Grand Canyon. Anyone been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, a few of you. Beautiful. Go. Go sometime. (laughs) It's it's great. Uh, Imagine standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon, though. And... We're going to jump across the Grand Canyon. Can you do that? No. But I'm a fairly athletic person. Uh, I exercise. I I try to stay in in shape. If I got a good running start, I could could jump a good long way before I'd plummet to my death. Now, Stephen, you've got the cane, right? It, it might be a little hard to, to get very far. I could get a lot farther than you could. You know that? And, and I could be very prideful. See how much farther I can jump than Stephen? Look how great I am. But the truth of the matter, what's going to happen is I'm just going to fall to my death a lot faster than he's going to. We're both going to die, though, if we try to do that. The point The point is this, is that when it comes to salvation, each and every one of us is just as lost. And no matter, no matter amount of works or performance-based religion, no matter how many times I show up at church, no matter how many times I read my Bible, no matter how much money I give to kingdom purposes, no matter how many times I volunteer to serve the less fortunate, none of that is really, in the grand scheme of things, going to get me any closer to my salvation. The only thing that saves us is that instead of jumping across the Grand Canyon, God reaches out across from the other side. And he is the one who brings us to where he is at. He is the one who finds that which is lost. He is the shepherd in the story. He is the woman who goes and finds the lost coin. When we're lost, we are lost. We have those blind spots. Pray and ask God for the wisdom 
Not to be like those Pharisees and scribes who didn't even recognize their own shortcomings. Pray that God would reveal to you the sinfulness in your life, the places where you are walking wayward, and for the grace to help get you back on the path. Now the thing about getting back on the path, how do you get back onto the path? You may not necessarily get back all on the path all at once. What do you do? You take one step. You can't take ten steps at a time, can you? One step at a time. You put the right foot in front of your left foot. And then you put your left foot in front of your right foot. So on and so forth. One step at a time. As you pray for the grace that God would reveal to you your blind spot. And as he reveals that blind spot to you, take that one step. Take that one step back to the path. And allow God's grace to help you there. I want to end with this thought. The lost who are found ultimately become the seekers. You go from this place of lostness to a place of having been found and in turn reach out, reach back to those who are lost to help them then find the way as well. We have a world that is lost. And if you don't believe me there, just watch the, the evening news. Open up you know, a news site on the, on the internet. You realize real quickly how lost this world is indeed. And we can pray God would do something about it. And his response oftentimes is, I already have. I made you and you and you and you to make a difference. And the way that we make a difference is not through guilt, but through grace. Some of you, maybe you have a child who is wayward, a child who is lost, and you want them to come back to the Father. It doesn't happen through guilt. You want them to come back and, and to be here, a part of the Good Shepherd family. But that doesn't happen. You, know, you don't want them to come back because mom or dad nag them. You don't want that to be their motivation. You want their motivation to be to know Jesus, the Savior. The first step to finding and to reaching the lost is, is prayer. Praying them into heaven. Prayer is a powerful thing. It's not the least we can do. It is the most that we can do. Be intentional with your prayers. And don't equate prayer with worry. Because I, I fear that's what we do a lot of times. That we have anxieties in our hearts, and maybe it is about a loved one, and we worry about them. But worry is not the same. Worry is churning that anxiety over and over in our mind. Prayer is to actually speak to God about that. And, and I encourage you, just don't, Pray silently in your mind, but actually speak those words out if no one is around, even if someone else is around. And if someone else is around and you feel maybe a little self-conscious about speaking out loud and they're, you're worried they might think you're talking to yourself, journal, write down your prayers. And, and pray for the lost who are near to you that you have a relationship with and, and maybe that, that you do have worry and anxiety in your heart about them. But also be intentional about praying for those who are, are lost that, that you may not be as familiar with. Think about your neighbors, the people who live around. And, and I, gotta, I imagine this morning that when you came to church, that a lot of them didn't. Do you know the names of your neighbors? It, it, it's hard to pray 
you know, for other people when we don't even know who they are. So I encourage you to start praying for your neighbors, praying for those who are near to you, praying for those who are far from you. And when, when we start praying for other people, you know, write their names down, that, that you can regularly pray for them on a, a daily basis. And when we start to pray for people, God gives us insight in how to respond, how to minister, how to help, and how to serve. Amazing grace. We sing it, don't we? I once was lost. Now I am found. Blind, but now I see. And that gives me the opportunity to serve our God, to serve his kingdom, and to seek together with him that which is lost. In Jesus' name, amen. As we conclude,